Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you to Riverlawn, and if you're visiting with us, I trust that you'll feel welcome, and you'll come back. Uh, today we're celebrating our graduating seniors, and these leaders of tomorrow are now completing one chapter and, and getting ready to start another. Congratulations. I, uh, as I was reviewing Chris's notes in preparation for this morning, I, uh, I had a very sobering thought that I, I guess I should confess to you. Uh, the thought was that when most of us in this room were celebrating this very day in our own families, today's honorees were not yet born. <laughs> and for some of you, this is the second go around. So um, this is a... Uh, this is a celebration. This is also a time for memories, and we're very proud of our graduates and looking, uh, looking forward to great things from you. There are several announcements that I'd like to bring to your attention in the bulletin, and uh, a couple of them. I need you to mark your calendar for the church picnic, which is this coming Wednesday, this coming Wednesday at Meadowwood Park, beginning at 530. Does anybody not know where Meadowwood Park is over in Tornado? Okay. So a nice park, well kept. We've, we've met there times in the past. It's a perfect place. We look forward to that. Bring something to share with everyone. And I would suggest you bring a lawn chair. There are picnic tables and things there, but if you, um, if you feel more comfortable in your own chair, bring that. Um, the second thing I want to bring to your attention is marriage night, which is this coming Friday. And Chris, could you shed more light on that, please? Uh, as as uh, Perry mentioned, um, we come here this morning as a family of God, uh, different seasons in life and different relationships. And one of the, the ways that's, that we want to honor the Lord in all of our relationships is by investing in the marriages that are a part of our community of faith, but also that are part of this larger community. So we are inviting and encouraging strongly uh, our, our, our married couples, engaged couples, to, to take part in marriage night, which is less than a week away. It's this coming Friday here at 6.30. Uh, I'm happy to tell you all about the amazing speakers that we're going to have during the, the simulcast event. But it's not just about us, as we'll hear this morning. Uh, this is one Another, one other way that we can be community-minded and try to provide a, a way to those in our larger community who we desire for them to grow stronger in their marriages and that Christ is at the center of their marriage. And also just have a wonderful time. Have a great time to be able to laugh and be enriched and to enjoy one another. Uh, there's child care and refreshments. I'm very thankful for Sherry Markham, who's been helping with this. So we hope you, you know, if, if, if you're not able to attend, you still have an opportunity to encourage this and, and share it with others who might be blessed by it. If you have questions about that, please let me know. Um, and there's a link for the registration, and I can tell you more about that. Um, also, do not we just jump right into the next please. one? Okay. So June 2nd is Church Night Out. This is also another community uh, endeavor, okay? We are going to have, instead of our kind of our typical prayer and praise service right here, um, we're having a different kind of time together, and we're going to have it in a different place, and we want, again, to, to make this open to our community. So on June 2nd at 6 o'clock at Coal River Coffee Company on Main Street, we're going to be having church night out. And we're going to have a time of worship. We're going to have a time just that's fun. And there'll be a barista there if you like your coffee in the evening. And, and just opportunity for us to fellowship and enjoy one another. And hopefully get to know some folks in our community as we seek to be those living into our call uh, to be a church ministering, serving, connecting with our community. So we hope you can join us for, for both of those. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Well. I don't know about you all, but last week when Jim told that um, the food pantry was, we only gathered like 10% of their usual amount, that just really broke my heart. And so I felt led this week that 
I felt that since school was about out and I have some time that I would try to do something for the food pantry. So if everybody could bring two or three cans each week, then I will take them down to the food pantry. So I will try to get like a list made of what is needed, but at this point I think I would say it's anything. So if you can bring soups or spaghetti sauce or whatever, um, just bring them in each week and then I will collect them and take them down to the food pantry. So um, if I felt that if everybody brought one can in, I mean, look how many we would have each week. So please feel that you should try to bring some stuff in for them. Um, yeah, just in the North X or the basket or all, you know, try to get some boxes and if we can, if we can gather enough stuff, then I'll bring boxes. <laughs> so. Okay. Any other announcements that we should talk about? garden, the senior living center anyway, and uh, together with some of the residents, we were able to make a hundred pillows or something. So we're going again Tuesday morning, so if any of you all would like to go, um, it's quite a blessing and it's just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, I've already taken the pillows to the hospital that we made, so we, we need all the help we can get. Ann will be out here in the parking lot at 9.30 Tuesday morning, and um, she will kind of carpool everybody up there, and then we will be there from this, like, 10.30 to 11.30. So it is, it's a wonderful experience. <laughs> Stuffing costs money. Thanks for supporting. So yes. ordered. <laughs> I, will, I will take care of that, hopefully. So Thank ordered. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Are there other, any other announcements? Okay, I just want to also, before we get into our worship service, want to bring to your attention a couple things that are going on around your church facilities. Um, we have a new roof on the sanctuary, for those of you who may or may not know that. It was actually a, uh, um, one of those roofs that you don't notice, and that was the design. So uh, I would like uh, to thank everyone who has, has given to the building fund uh, for many years because we did indeed use that money to put the roof on. The storms that hit here on Tuesday, Wednesday, mm -hmm. I didn't worry about it for one second. <laughs> so everything is dry. There are no tarps. It's wonderful. Uh, we have several other projects that you'll see beginning to take place over the next several months. Again, these primarily are being funded by gifts from folks such as Bob Wilson's family and uh, other funds that we've been saving. So we'll be looking at uh, doing a coating on the roof in the gym. We'll be looking at completing the fence that goes across the playground, between the playground and the old his house lot. Uh, we're going to be putting new additional topsoil in the his house lot and we'll probably have some tree trimming going on. So you'll see a lot of activity going on and um, I just wanted to make you aware that how those were being funded since we've just come through a, uh, a challenging year. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now for worship with our prelude, Heavenly Sunlight, and I'm told that the words to this will be on the screen.
Let's continue our worship this morning by joining in the singing of Shine, Jesus Shine, which is on page 431 in your hymn book and also on the screen. So please stand as you're able. <coughs> While the Lord knows our every thought and deed long before we even think about acting them out, he calls us to confession as part of our cleansing. Please hear this prayer of confession. Gentle God, loving guardian, compassionate Father, please heal our foolish ways. We long to reject the advice of the wicked and the slow seduction of a sinful direction but our speech and actions often contradict that. We yearn to be like trees planted along the waters, bearing fruits of righteousness. But the scoffers call out to us, and the temptation to return evil for evil withers our souls like shrubs in the desert. Our hearts seek the ways of your spirit and the waters of life, but our footsteps often lead us in the opposite direction. This is not your hope, nor is it your plan for us. Forgive us, Lord. Turn us again to the healing you so freely offer. 
and mend the brokenness in our lives and in our world. I would ask now that you just take a moment for your own silent confession. Amen. Please hear these words of forgiveness. God looks at us in our brokenness and offers grace and healing to those who look to the Lord. You have the assurance of God's faithful love, his mercy and forgiveness, as is evidenced by his son on Calvary as an atonement for our sins. Your debt has been paid. You are forgiven. Go forward now and be the person he called you to be. be seated.
tell you something about a story that's in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, we know it's what? It's true, right. And this is a time when Jesus was talking to his followers, and he said, one day I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take all of you over here, and I'm going to say to you, you're here, and I'm going to take you to heaven to live with me forever and ever and ever. And I'm going to do this because when I was hungry, you gave me food. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And when I didn't have nice clothes, you gave me clothes. And they wanted to go to heaven and live with Jesus forever, right? But they looked at him and they said, Jesus, we didn't ever see you hungry and give you food. And we didn't ever see you thirsty and give you something to drink. And we didn't ever see you uh, without clothes and give you some clothes. And this is the important part. Jesus said, if you did it to the people around you, it's just like you did it to me. Got it? If you share with the people around you, it's just like you share with me. Now, that is so important that we are going to play just a short game with it. Okay, I'm going to put this. We're going to pretend like these These are kind of, uh, oh, I got them at the Dollar General store. Bath bombs, that's what they are. Thank you. So what I want you to do with them, every time I say that we're going to pay a bill, we're going to pay it with one of those bath bombs, okay? I bet your mom and dad about once a month sit down at a table and they pay the bills. Sometimes maybe you're asleep and you don't see them, but it happens. So let's say that your mom and dad sit down to pay the bills and the first bill they're going to pay is going to be for the house payment. So I want every one of you to give me a ball. Tesla, can you put a ball in there? from you, Ruth. Just one. Okay? That's good. Pretty good. How about this one? How about you give me? There. Okay, now the next thing, what do you suppose that, that they would need? How about, what? That's what I was going to say. That's exactly what I was going to say washing machine and the air conditioner and the lights that go on and on. So let's have one for electricity. Can you give me another one, Tessa? Good job. Okay. Now let's see what else would we need. I know. How did you get here? In a, in a car. And you almost always have a car payment. So give me one for the car payment. You know, we forgot something very, very important, didn't we? Water. No, yeah, there's water. Okay, the water bill. Well, we can't have one bill. We can't take a bath. We can't drink. Okay, give me one for the water bill. Okay. We have a problem. What's our problem? Tesla doesn't have a, a bomb to put in here. Brody doesn't have one. Uh-oh. What would we do? What? Remember what I told you about? You don't have any either, Ellen. Uh-oh. <laughs> what are we going to do? We're going to share it, aren't we? You've got two. So what are you going to do? You can share it. You can, put, you can put two more in here, and then we'll all 
have a little bit less, but we'll all have water, right? That's what Jesus told us to do, to share. Well, that's what our church family out here is going to do. They have a, you want to put that in here? No, that's okay. <laughs> oh, that look. Uh, our church family has a little extra. And so this morning, they're going to give us a little bit extra, and you're going to go out and collect it for us, and you'll bring it up here, and we'll get it to the people who need it. Because that's what Jesus told us to do in the Bible, right? Okay. Take your basket. Lord, we do thank you that we are able to come before you and that you are a loving Father and that you hear our prayers. That we do not come before you merely as, as workers or merely as servants, though we are called to be that. You've called us your children. You've made us your own. You invite us to come and run to you. And so we do. For you are the giver of life. You are the one who sustains. You are our hope. And so we come before you and we give you praise for the, the powerful ways you've been at work in our midst time and time and time again throughout the ages and throughout our lives. We give you praise for your hand of provision and protection, deliverance and healing. And most of all for that hope of a life beyond life, beyond this grave. Lord, we pray that we can be mindful of the words of our Savior, Jesus. Whenever you did it unto the least of these, you've done it to me. Give us eyes and hearts that perceive and respond. And when we're in need, to be able to receive it and to also see the, the love and face of Christ in those who give. And so we pray, particularly for Joey right now. We pray for his family, for your sustaining spirit and your everlasting hope. Lord, we pray that, that as we walk through the valley, they will feel the shepherd. We thank you that you are our life. We thank you for the ways that you respond to us and even for the times that we don't understand or we're waiting or you seem far distant or we're confused. Lord, we pray that you once again remind us of your promise, of your goodness and love and faithfulness toward us. And so for the burdens on our hearts that we both have shared and those that remain that we have not heard, but you know. We pray that we trust you, we seek you, that you give us hearts that move toward the need, even if we're unaware of it, that you put us in the right place at the right time so that Christ's love will be on display. And we, we thank you and we pray all these things in the name of the one, our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We thank our deacons for being there with the mics. Uh, one, of the, one of the special joys that we have this morning, I'm kind of glad it wasn't mentioned earlier so we can say it now, is uh, that we, we celebrate, it's a special day, we celebrate our graduates. Uh, we're so glad that they're with us. We give praise and glory to God and uh, Kenzie, Katie Beth. We have something we want to tell you. Um, well done. 
Well done. Uh, we're proud of you. We're excited for you. And at this time, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Yeah, if you don't mind bearing with me, come, come forward for just a moment. Join me up on the stage over here. Thank you, thank you. All right, so this is a day for both of you that maybe hasn't come soon enough, uh, but I'm sure you're very excited, and maybe your parents think it comes too soon, you know? I don't know. But uh, one journey has come to an end. Another journey is just beginning. I wonder... All that the Lord has in store for both of you, we're excited for you. Um, and so we want to do more than just wish you well. We want to pray the Lord's blessing over you both and all of your endeavors to come. And so we have this charge for you. I'm going to get in front of you so you don't have to twist your neck. How's that sound? Conti continue to build on the right foundation of Jesus Christ. Continue to focus on him the rock. Continue to seek after him in all the days to come. Continue to uh, long and wonder and grow. Wherever you may be, whatever you set your mind and your heart and your energy toward, keep him at the forefront. And so as an expression of our love and a celebration of you, we want to present to you a gift uh, which we hope will be a light to you on your on your journey. This one's, well, they're, they're all, they both have, have I want to make sure, there's writing in there, so we want to make sure that they're given to the right person. So um, we, we rejoice with you, and we will ask, is there any, you don't, don't feel compelled, but is there anything you'd like to share with the congregation? And if you want to, you can use the mic, or I can just tell you, where, tell them where you're going. So <laughs> is there anything you want to share? No, that's, a, I didn't give them a heads up on this one. So, but we've got, Kenzie, I know, is going to Marshall, right? Katie Beth, you're going to state. All right, so um, need not too far. And so we look forward to opportunities to, to come and connect, and you, you are in our prayers. So let's pray together. Let's pray. Lord, we pray um, as Kenzie and Katie Beth begin this new journey, we ask your blessing upon them. May they seek after you. May they find their strength and refuge in you. May their faith and life be deepened by the Spirit of Christ with each new day. Lord, give them a singleness of heart and action to honor you. May they be rooted and established in your love. May they each be like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding fruit in every season for your glory. And Lord, may this be true of all of us. May we treasure our Savior above all things. And may your grace be evident in our lives, in all the places that you send us. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's, let's rejoice over them. Let's and we will have a time, we'll have a time of, of fellowship in your honor following the service in the gym and we're glad that your families could be with us, and uh, we can't wait to be able to rejoice some more. So we're, glad, we're very, very glad for you guys. Thank you so much. Good for you. Amen. All right, you may return to your seats. I've, I'll, I've held you up there long enough. <coughs> Let's turn to the word together as we hear of God's plans for us from Isaiah chapter 29. Let's prepare to hear God's word. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. 
Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, again, we we give you praise and thanks for this morning, for your word, for your plans and purposes for your goodness and faithfulness. May we, may we hear your voice, your call to come, to return, to pray, to trust, to serve. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, smart people can make some pretty dumb predictions. Charles Duell, commissioner of the U.S. Office of Patents, said in 1899, everything that can be invented has been invented. <laughs> Just getting started. The, he- the head of IBM once said of this proposal, I don't know what use anyone could find for a machine that would make copies of documents. The inventor went on to find Xerox. DECA Recording Company rejected the band in 1962 with this. We don't like their sound, and guitar music is on its way out. Anyone know the band? The Beatles. And my, my, my grandpa said that, too. My grandpa told my dad when he was a little boy, my dad loved the Beatles. He said, ah, they'll be done in a year. You know. Not to say that my grandpa was, you know, I'm not, you know, I love my grandpa. <laughs> The chairman, this is the last one, this is my favorite. The chairman of Digital Equipment Corporation said in 1977, okay, most of us were around then, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. (laughs) And now every single one of us has one in our pockets, right? It's, It's amazing. Who of us really can see the future? On a day where we honor our graduates, what kind of world are we sending them into? Is there an overarching purpose to this random world, this uncertain world in which we live? And if there is this overarching purpose, how can they know it? How can we know it? You know, looking forward, I think if we really think about it and take the time to consider it, you know, that can be a little intimidating because we don't have the whole picture. None of us do. There's still so much to be discovered. But the wonderful thing about it and what we so often forget is that we look forward as those who are loved and led by the Lord. We always need to remember that. 
And God promises his people in our passage, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. But sometimes that's the coffee mug verse, and we miss out on the rest of the passage, which really makes it all the more profound, because God says this as he has sent them into captivity and says, Settle down, you're going to be here for 70 years. To think about this for a minute. He sends the Babylonians to destroy their temple, to take them captive. They're going to be enslaved in this foreign land. They're not happy about it for a very long time. In fact, those going in, probably not coming out. How can this be? How can God have a plan to prosper and not harm them, but then also to allow this? How does this promise work in a fallen world like theirs, in a world like ours? How can we find God's purpose in the midst of the challenges that we face? Well, let's examine God's answer. Our text gives us some life lessons, and each of them is really crucial to our problem, the problem that we all find ourselves in. Verse 11, we've said it already, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And so here we learn lesson number one, God has a plan for our lives. Now that, unfortunately, becomes kind of a cliche phrase. Uh, we hear it so frequently, but we miss just how significant that truth, that biblical truth is not to keep the focus on us, but to realize that God has a plan. Over and over and over again in Scripture, it declares this fact. In fact, James teaches us, and we talked about this when we did our James study. James says this, and this is to keep us from arrogance, because we often love to make our own plans and assume everything's going to go just as planned, you know, and then we get surprised when it doesn't. But James says this, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. That's how we stay in that posture of humility. The psalmist prayed, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. It's about your will, Psalm 143. So whatever your decision, whatever your question, whatever your problem, whatever your uncertainty, know first off that the Lord has a plan for you and has that plan for today. Lesson number two, God knows his plans for us, but we don't. We don't like that usually, at least a lot of the time. But if you look through scripture, there's this, this common reality. No one in the Bible got a five-year plan, right? They, they didn't get the heads up of all that was still to come. We read in Hebrews 13, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place where he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He's just one of many examples. When Moses finally agreed to face Pharaoh, he didn't know there was going to be a Red Sea. When Daniel started his day in prayer, he didn't know he'd end up with the lions. The fishermen who left their boats to follow Jesus. Follow him where? Don't think they were expecting to start the global Christian movement. And then what about Paul? Who often was seeking the call of God and often got, nope, was shut, the door was shut to that country. The door was shut to that city. But when he followed God's call to Macedonia, when he baptized Lydia in Philippi, he didn't know that he was bringing the gospel to the Western world. And that's just a snippet. And it's been that way since. So that gives us some context for our own lives. Whatever your problem, whatever your decision today, know that you will not always have the answer when you want to know the answer. You won't. And it certainly won't be as soon as you want to know the answer. So we need to refuse to trust our human wisdom, our education, our experience. Tell God that you don't know the right plan and that you need his. Develop that as your reflex to go to him in prayer every time. 
Lesson number three, God's plan is for our best. This might be the hardest one because there are times when we don't feel that and we don't understand that. But we're told his purpose is to give you hope and a future. Now, well over 50 times, God's word promises again and again that he loves us just because he knew we would forget or doubt it constantly. So he said it again and again in so many different ways over so many centuries. Isaiah 30, verse 18. And I love this verse, and it's one that we don't hear very often. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He will rise up to show you compassion. What a beautiful picture. And there, there's no place where this was more true. This was revealed most fully, most sacrificially when he gave us his son. The father proved his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for you and for me. And because of what it cost him, because of the lengths to which he went to save us, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again and again, he shows us the beautiful unveiling of his love and plan and purpose for us. And you can't separate it. When you're talking about the purpose of God and you're talking about the love of God, they don't, they're not in separate places. They go hand in hand. And so even though, as we look at our passage this morning with the Israelites, even though their rebellion had landed them in Babylon, God loved them. And was working in them and through them and around them. And even though our sin has caused us guilt and caused him grief, guess what? He loves us. His love never fails. But he has a plan to give us hope, plan to give us a future. So what we need to do is not doubt that love. We need to decide here and now that we're going to follow his plan wherever it leads because we know that his best is what's best for you and me. Lesson number four, God's plan begins today. Often we keep thinking of it as this future thing that will eventually become reality. Well, there's that part too, but guess what? It begins today. God's plan has been described as that flashlight, giving you enough sight, showing you enough to take that next step. Not necessarily 20 steps, but that next step. That God had a plan for where and how the Israelites were to live. Now, this may sound like a long-term plan, and it was, but they still had to live into it day by day. We see his plan in the earlier part in our passage. God tells them, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. He has a plan for their families and the families they were to have. Marry and have sons and daughters. He even had a plan for the country that had enslaved them. And I think this, we did a study um, with Timothy Keller on the, the gospel in life and our call to our city. And I think this is very true for us as well. And the places that God has placed us, Riverlawn here in St. Albans, in our community, uh, this still has a place. But do we hear these words? Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so even from Babylon, here's God sharing his purpose. And this, I think, is a very key lesson that we learn in this passage and for life. They could not know God's purpose for the future until they were willing to obey his purpose in the present. Are we doing that? For instance, I can't learn calculus until I learn arithmetic. I can't drive to Charleston until I know how to operate a car. As Oswald Chambers said, we must be of use to God where we are because we certainly cannot be of use to him where we're not. That sounds pretty simple. But you'd be surprised how we don't really live into that. Often it's it's very profound that we need to realize how are we faithfully serving and living where we are in the moment. We must be close to God today if we're to hear his voice tomorrow. And finally, lesson number five, God has a plan for his kingdom. Not your kingdom, not the American dream kingdom, but for his kingdom. God blessed the Israelites because they were his children. Was that the only reason? 
He was blessing them because they were a means to a much larger end. He blessed them so that through them he could bless the world. He prospered them in Babylon so that when he would return them home, through them would come the Messiah. As prosperous as Babylon might be, it's still a foreign country. Why is that significant? Well, you and I, whether we realize it or not, still live on foreign soil. Scripture calls the church, calls Christians on multiple occasions, aliens and strangers on earth. Our best day here cannot begin to compare to our first day in glory. And so every day we live, we need to remind ourselves, and this is such a hard thing because I know that I'm, I'm pulled into just whatever's going on around me. To the world that I do see, we need to be reminded again and again, we do not live for this world. We live for the king of eternity. And so the decisions that we make every day must be framed by that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. When they asked him, how should we pray? Jesus says, I'll tell you, this should be your orientation, your focus, your driving force. This is where you should go again and again and again. Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me ask you, when was the last time you made a decision based on what would most glorify God? To build his kingdom on earth. To invite and involve others in the work. When was the last time? So now, as we get back to this original question, because you're like, Chris, you still haven't really dealt with this, how these things work. How can this plan to prosper and not be harmed be reconciled with the Babylon where God's people found themselves? With the Babylon with which is our fallen society and world today. How can that be reconciled? And the key word is in redemption. We have a redeeming God. The Bible never promises, never promises that bad will not come to good people. Quite the opposite. Jesus told us multiple times, expect it to get bad. Because it's going to. He warns his followers, in this world you will have trouble. Oh, I wish he would have said more. Oh, wait, he did. Take heart. I've overcome the world. That's what we need to remember. We will encounter that hardship, but we encounter it with the one who's overcome. Jesus was crucified. Paul was beheaded. All but John and the, 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 those apostles, they were martyred for their faith. John was exiled to Patmos. A million Christians died in the first centuries because of their faith, simply for following Jesus. God never promised that his plan to prosper us and give us a future meant temporal health and wealth. That's not it. That's not what it's about. Instead... We see that his present plan is a means for our eternal good. We see it in the other verses of our passage. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you and will bring you back to the place from which I've carried you into exile. What's all that about? God would redeem their Babylonian captivity by using it to draw his people back to himself. He had to send them out to bring them back. In Babylon, as they had not done in Israel, his people would come and pray to me. They would seek me with all your heart. Then he would return, return them to their land, and through them one day, send the Lion of Judah, send the Savior of the world, send Jesus the Christ. He would redeem the struggle they faced by using it to draw them and so many others to himself. That's what it's all about. And so I don't need to understand all the ways that God is to know that he is. 
What do I mean by that? Well, I don't have to understand aerodynamics to board an airplane, as long as the pilot does, right? So the question is, do you trust in the all-sufficient faithfulness of our God? And if so, then God stands ready to use your difficult times for his powerful purposes. So where does this promise find you today? Are you seeking God's direction for your future? Are you struggling with a hard place and wondering why? Years ago, after a powerful community worship service, our local ministry alliance met together, and we were discussing all the reasons that the service was so moving, and, and we were looking for ways that the next community experience would be equally successful for all those who were able to come. And then one of my colleagues just smiled and looked at us and said, it's not about us. And I've never forgotten that. And he was so very right. Life is not about us. This is Babylon. This isn't the promised land. We are subjects of the kingdom. We are servants of the king. We must surrender our lives, our plans, our agendas to his purpose, asking only how we can serve Christ as our king, help others to serve him as their king. It's when we do that that we find his good, pleasing and perfect will. Then we can walk in his purpose each day. When we surrender ourselves, when we deny ourselves for his kingdom purposes. So we must lose our lives in order to save them. We must surrender our lives in order to live them. And so to our graduating seniors and to every single person here today, my prayer is that your passion will be to display the worth of Jesus Christ that you will treasure him above all else. And that may the glory and the grace of Jesus Christ shine through your life as you walk in his purpose in all the days to come. Let's pray. Lord, we, we do praise you and thank you for your good, your good, good, good purposes for us. And for your amazing love for us. And for how that was displayed. For how you rose to, sh to shine compassion on us through our Savior Jesus. May we never forget that. Wherever you place us, wherever you send us, may we not think that we are stuck. But instead, those who have been placed purposefully, lovingly, to broadcast your grace, to show the world what you've done and who you are and who we are because of it. To you be the glory now and forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings come. Grace in all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Please pray with me. Lord, as we bring these tithes and offerings, it is so that you are praised. Lord, as you send us out to whatever you've called us, to the places you've called us, may it be for your praise. Lord, we thank you that by your grace you've made us your child and a part of your kingdom. May we live not only in an understanding of that, but in a gratitude and a joy. And so we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. And now, people of God, let us sing together, Solid Rock.
After receiving the benediction, we encourage you to share the blessing with one another as we go into the fellowship hall for a time of honoring our graduates, celebrating God's plans for them, and praying for them. And now hear this benediction. The Apostle Paul writes, and we affirm and pray, this is our prayer for you, that you may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best. It may be pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the Christ, day of Christ Jesus. Amen.